Mark chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 38, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter this morning, Lord willing. Sometimes when you read through Scripture, you find some that are a doozy, some that are hard to wrap your head around and understand, and it just so happens that we have quite a few of those today. So these passages that we're going to look at today may make you scratch your head, but you are not alone. They have made me scratch my head, and and you will discover if you research them even further that there's not really a lot of good answers for some of the questions we may have, even among some of the scholars and theologians and commentaries. Some of the things we discuss, uh, commentaries just kind of skip over. They don't hit on them either. Uh, So a lot of these things, it's hard to really know exactly maybe what Jesus meant. And so we'll look at the text and we'll just kind of talk about some things that that maybe some of this could mean and and maybe the overarching uh, point that Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples in these passages as well as you and I. And so uh, we'll pray and then we'll start in verse 38 and we'll just kind of break it through a verse or two at a time. So let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning, and I thank you for these good words, and there is going to be some stuff here, God, that maybe we just don't understand. God, I don't understand it all for sure, and I pray that you just help me to preach and teach in a way today that's going to bring glory to you, even on the stuff that maybe I don't have a good answer to. I pray that the Holy Spirit would just open our hearts and help us to understand as much as we can and what we need to, dear Lord. I pray that you hide me behind the cross, that you remove any nerves or any pride, God, and I pray that you just help me to be faithful to present your word in a way, God, that's going to be helpful to each one of us here this morning. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, a couple of weeks ago, uh, just a refresher, we talked about uh, the apostles were asking, uh, were arguing about who was the greatest among them. And Jesus kind of set them in their place and said, look, it's not for you to try to be the greatest. It's for you to try to be the least, that you want to be the least of all for those you are around. When you are on this earth, people we encounter, uh, we should not seek to be the greatest of all, but we should seek to be a servant of all. And we see that all throughout Scripture, and we see that throughout the book of Mark as well. And that's kind of what we saw last week. And Jesus used this illustration. He used this comparison for his disciples and said, look, uh, he called this little child over and he says, if you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you must be like this little child. Now we flip back to Matthew and we looked at uh, a similar story there. And in Matthew, Jesus said, look, to be humble like a child. And so what Jesus was really calling the apostles to in the verses we looked at a couple of weeks ago was, was a humility, that they wouldn't think too highly of themselves and think that they were the greatest because they were chosen by Jesus uh, or even amongst the 12 uh, arguing about who was the greatest of the 12. But Jesus says, look, you got to get that stuff out of your mind. You can't worry about trying to be the greatest. And the same is true for us in this church or whatever it may be. We can't say, boy, I am a super Christian. I'm better than all the rest of the Christians. I'm better than all the rest of the people in this church because I give more money or I have more skills or more abilities or more talents. Uh, We don't want to have the mindset that we are somehow better than other brothers and sisters in Christ. We are equal to and that we are all saved by Jesus Christ. Yes, it may be true that some of us have more gifts or talents or different gifts and talents than others, but that in no way makes us greater than anyone else. And we don't want to fall in to that trap. Instead, we want to be humble, uh, as Jesus was humble, uh, giving ourselves as a servant of all. And so that's what we had talked about a couple of weeks ago. And I bring that up because that reference and illustration that Jesus made to that little child Uh, We'll we'll come back into into play here in a few verses as we read along. All right, uh, excuse me, Mark chapter 9, verse 38. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. Don't stop him, said Jesus, because there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us, and whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. Now, in Matthew chapter 18, we see uh, verses similar to what we see before and after what we just read. 
And in Matthew 18, they're all together, but Mark inserts this other little part of the story uh, here in between the two parts that are together in Matthew 18. Now, most of what we read today in these passages are things that are covered in the other gospel accounts, but they're not always in quite the same order. Uh, now, it could just be that later on when these uh, writers of the gospel accounts were writing this, maybe their memory was not quite as clear as when it happened because the things that we read that were written were not written in the moment that they happened. They were written years later. And so maybe uh, they misremembered when some of these events occurred. Maybe it's possible that Jesus said some of the same things on multiple occasions. And some of them covered them on one occasion and some of them covered them on another occasion. Those are all possibilities. Uh, but in, in this passage we look at today, all, almost all the things we see are talked about in other gospel accounts. Now, in this particular passage, the problem that we see here is John says, look, there's another person who's casting out demons in your name. And John said, so we tried to stop him. Now, Jesus had the 12 that he had invested in for all of this time now, as we've seen through the book of Mark. But there were other people who were followers of Jesus who were also doing the work of Jesus. And John uh, was trying to put a stop to it. He said, look, Jesus, this one's not with us. He's, he's off on his own. But he's doing this miraculous thing. He's driving out these demons and he's doing it in your name. But we tried to stop him because he's not with us. But Jesus says, let him go. If he's casting out demons in my name, if he's not against us, then he is for us. He can't do this miraculous work in my name and then later uh, go and deny me and, and, and speak evil against me, Jesus said. So what Jesus was saying is that this one you see doing these miraculous works, this driving out demons... Let him be, because he is doing this work. He is doing it in my name. He is a child of the kingdom. He is part of the kingdom of God. And Jesus goes on to say, And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of my name, since you belong to the Messiah, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. Now, this person that John was talking about was doing a miraculous work. Uh, the, the fact that he was able to drive out demons shows that he definitely had the power of Jesus within him. But Jesus said, look, even if someone's not doing such a grand and miraculous work, even if somebody gives you a cup of water in my name because you are my follower, then you know that they are mine. There, that is, we can see those who are followers of Jesus Christ based on their actions, based on how they live their life, based on how we can see God working in their life and God using them to work in the lives of those around them. And that's what this guy who was driving out these demons was doing. It was clear that he was a follower of Jesus, or else these demons would not have fled in Jesus' name when this person cast them out. And Jesus said, or at least I believe what Jesus was saying here is, look, whether it's a grand work or whether it's the smallest work that there can be, giving someone a cup of water, that's how we can know that they are a follower of Jesus Christ on how they treat other followers of Jesus Christ, how they treat other people, even in the most simplest acts. Now, it doesn't take much for us to give a cup of water to someone. That's about the easiest thing we could possibly do. And that's true just about anywhere in the world. There aren't many places in the world that, that at the very least, you wouldn't have a cup of water that you could give to someone in need. And I think what Jesus is saying, even the least thing that is done in his name to those who follow him, to those who are in need, the least little thing that is done is something that God wants us to do. And it shows that we are indeed God's people. Now, it's interesting that this other man who was not with them was able to drive out demons because if you remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, the disciples were in a situation when Jesus came back down from the mountain and they were trying to do just that and they could not drive out this demon on their own power. And Jesus came down and was able to do it and they said, look, why couldn't we do it? And he said, well, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Uh, but the key there, I think, is, is that even Jesus' 12 were not able to cast out the demon in that situation, but here this other man was able to cast out the demon. Now, casting out demons is something that can only occur by the power of Jesus. And we see a good example of this in Acts chapter 19. If you want to flip there, you can. If not, just listen. But in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16, we see a good example of someone who is trying to cast out demons 
without the power of Jesus. That's not just someone. It's actually seven people in this story who are in the process of trying to cast out these, this demon. And let's see what happens to them in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. Now, this is a prime example of people who knew of Jesus, these seven sons of Sceva, who were trying to do this exorcism, and they said, look, I order you, demon, to come out of this man by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Now, they were not saying, look, by the Jesus that, that we follow, by the Jesus that, that is our Lord and Savior, by his power, the power that's within us. He doesn't say, they don't say, look, by the Jesus that we follow. They say, look, by the Jesus that Paul follows. And what did the demon do? Did the demon flee just because they spoke the name of Jesus? No, because they had no power. Because the power comes from Jesus. And even though they knew the name of Jesus, they weren't following Jesus. They did not have the power of Jesus. And the demon says, look, I know this Jesus you talk about. I even know this Paul you talk about. But I don't know you. Other words, I'm not afraid of you. What can you do to me? You don't have the power of Jesus because you're not a follower of Jesus. And since they weren't followers of Jesus, not only were they not able to cast out the demon, but the demon overtook them. The demon-possessed man overtook them, and they fled naked. But that's not what happened with this guy we see in Mark chapter 9. This guy was in the name of Jesus casting out demons, and the demons were actually fleeing from the people who they were being cast from. So Jesus says, look, even though this guy's not with us in our group, immediately with us all the time, he is still one of mine, and we see that by the work he's doing. Whether it's a great work or whether it's something as simple as, as giving someone a glass of water, we can know that this person is a child of God. Now, we can maybe find areas in our life where we may be guilty of the same thing. The first thing that popped into my mind was denominations, different, different religious organizations. Now, uh, every religious group, every denomination has certain beliefs that they have, and they may differ to some extent on how certain passages are interpreted. And it may be easy for us, especially if we've attended one denomination our whole life, and we see another denomination doing something differently or maybe interpreting a passage different than us, we may say, I don't know about them. I don't know if they're really Christians or not. And we may, we may say, boy, I'm not so sure about how they do things or the way they do things. Now, sure, they may be different, and they may even be wrong in some instances in what they do, but so may you and I. Even Baptists don't get everything right. I know that may come as a shock to you, but if the fact is that there's no denomination that I believe that gets everything completely right. We do the best we can. We interpret the best we can. But the important thing is, is Jesus at the core of what is being done? Is Jesus the one that people are following? Is Jesus the one that people are seeking? Is Jesus the one that people realize he is the only Savior and Lord? It, through him, uh, he is the only one through which we can be forgiven. And so we may see churches, other churches and denominations doing things different than us, and we may even sometimes think the same thing that John thought. Well, wait a minute. Should they be doing that? Should they be doing things that way? That's kind of crazy. That's kind of strange. I've never heard of that before. Well, maybe the works they're doing are just what God wants them to do, and maybe there are some areas that we become judgmental of others when we ourselves have failed in that area. Maybe they've gotten it right, and we've gotten it wrong. Well, we don't ever think about that. It's always the other groups that have gotten it wrong. But Jesus said, look, don't be so quick to judge them. Even though he's not with us, or even though people are not of our denomination, doesn't mean that they are not children of God and are not doing God's work. So we need to be careful in those situations. All right, let's continue on a little further in uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Now, Here's the part in Matthew 18 where it's all connected because Jesus had spoken about the little child earlier when he had used that as an example for the uh, disciples saying that, uh, look, those who are in the kingdom of God who want to be, like, uh, be in the kingdom of God are to be like a little child. And then he continues with this thought that we're about to read in Matthew 18 without any separation between it. 
And so in Mark, Mark chapter 9, verse 42, he says, But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, this is a, a pretty serious uh, thing that Jesus is saying. He, he talks about whoever causes the downfall of the little one, it would be better for him if a stone was tied around his neck and he was hung into the sea. Now, whatever is going to happen that Jesus doesn't elaborate on in those couple of verses we read, uh, whatever is going to happen to the one who causes the downfall of the little child, it's going to be much worse than having a stone tied around your neck and being thrown into the ocean. Now, you can imagine how unpleasant that would be. Uh, none of us probably want to be tied up with a stone and thrown into the water. That would be, that'd be a tough death. You would be drugged to the bottom. You would drown in just a few minutes, and that would be a pretty excruciating death. And Jesus says, whatever is going to happen to the one who causes the downfall of the little child is going to be worse than this. It would be better if that happened than what was, is going to happen. Now, when we see this little child here, we have to consider what Jesus may have been talking about. Now, I brought up Matthew 18 because it flows in the context of 18 where he's talking about a little child, an actual physical child who is there, and then he uses the same language here in this part of the passage, whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones. Now, it's possible that in the context that we're looking at, that Jesus was literally speaking about physical, earthly little children. Now, there's no doubt that Jesus loved children. That's clear. Uh, we, we can't deny that, even if that's not maybe what he means literally here. The fact is still true uh, that, that we should raise our children up and take care of our children and not cause them to go into evil things or lead them into evil ways. That's important. Parents and grandparents that we try to bring our children and those children whose lives we have an influence upon in a godly way. And that may very well be what Jesus is speaking of here. He may be literally speaking of saying, hey, when you encounter little children, you better bring them up right. You better not put any stumbling blocks in their path or anything that's going to lead them in a sinful way because, boy, to destroy the life of the child, a child, Jesus says, it's going to be bad. It's going to be worse what you're going to experience than if you had a stone around your neck and were thrown into the ocean. Now, that could be what Jesus is talking about since he did previously talk about an actual physical little child. But often what we see with Jesus is he uses symbolic language. And so the language he used with the child was symbolic. That is that children of God are to be like a child of this world. There's supposed to be a certain humility and maybe even a certain innocence like we see in a child, a certain willingness to trust what you hear. If you, uh, Maybe you remember when you were a child or maybe you encounter children now and when you see children at a young age and when they trust you as, a, as an aunt, an uncle, a parent, a grandparent, whatever it is, when you tell that child something, they believe what you say because you are who they look up to. You are who they trust. And there is a big responsibility there that there should be that innocence and that kind of trust when our parents tell us something. And the same is true physically, or, uh, spiritually as well, that God is our heavenly Father and we should trust God and know we can trust God in everything he says. Now, Jesus uses this illustration of a child to say, look, Here's what an earthly child is like. You should be humble like an earthly child, and, and, and that should be reflected spiritually in you. You should be as a child spiritually. And so Jesus was clearly, even though he was speaking in a physical sense, he was making a spiritual connection. He was using that example to make a spiritual connection. Now, as I said, Jesus very well could be speaking literally of children here, uh, and at the very least, he's doing that. But, but he also could be speaking in a spiritual sense when he says these little ones, whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones of mine, well, he could be talking about those who are his followers, not just his disciples, but you and I who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. Or he could be speaking of both. He could be using a physical thing, which he means in a physical way, uh, and applying it spiritually well. It could be uh, both and. So I'll let you decide for yourself what you think Jesus may be saying there. But there are other scriptures that speak of Christians as little ones or little children, and there are quite a few of them. 
And so the fact that Jesus may be referring to followers of him here instead of physical children, I think there's good scriptural evidence to support that that's exactly what he's saying. If you want to look at some of these, you can with me. I'll read them kind of quickly for time's sake. But in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says, Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Now, he doesn't say children or ones there. He says little flock, but the language is somewhat reminiscent to what we just read in Mark chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, it says, And whoever gives just... uh, Excuse me, and whoever gives just a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is a disciple, I assure you, he will never lose his reward. So there Jesus even says who the little one is. It is his disciple. Uh, Even in Paul's writings, we see the same language used. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, it says, And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints and the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children, tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning and cleverness and the techniques of deceit, But speaking the truth and love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. We also see the same type of language used in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Now, there's a lot we could say about Zechariah 13, 7, but we won't uh, get into that today. But you can go back and read that chapter if you would like to. But God is speaking in that chapter about judgment that is coming on his people because of their disobedience. And, and this is a prophetic word that Jesus himself even explains to us in the New Testament that it is indeed speaking of him. In uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7, it says, Sword, awake against my shepherd, against the man who is my associate. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will also turn my hand against the little ones. Now, Jesus, or excuse me, God is speaking of his children Israel here. Those are the little ones who he is going to turn his hand against. And this uh, is a prophecy about Jesus, that the sword is going to come against Jesus, or that is he is going to be killed, and those who follow him are going to flee. And that's exactly what happened. When they came to arrest Jesus, where did his disciples go? Boom, they all split and went different directions. And Jesus even quoted this passage as that time was was approaching, letting his disciples know, okay, this is what is about to happen. And so we see that similar language. The little ones in that passage are indeed God's children. Now, the best example we can see in the New Testament uh, is provided to us by John in the book of 1 John. Now, there are a lot of references to little children, and they're all in reference to God's people, those who are Christians. We'll look at a few of them right now. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, uh, the very first thing he says, John does after his introduction in chapter 1, he starts off chapter 2 by saying, My little children, I am writing these things so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In 1 John 3, verse 7, he says, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. 1 John 4, verse 4, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, the last verse of the, of the book, it says, Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Now, all of those references that John makes there to little children are speaking of Christians, those who are followers of Jesus Christ. And so it seems that at, least, at least likely to some extent that that's what Jesus means here when he speaks of little children. Whoever causes the downfall of little children, that is whoever keeps people from following Jesus and being obedient to him and is a stumbling block to him, well, there's going to be a harsh judgment that's going to come. How harsh of that that judgment? Well, Jesus just says it's going to be worse than if you had a stone around your neck and were thrown into the sea. Now, in that particular instance, he's talking about those who keep people from him or cause others to stumble. 
But then he shifts gears into some more difficult verses following, starting in verse 43. In verse 43, it says, And if your hand causes your downfall, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes your downfall, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell, the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with, no, with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, boy, ain't that a good one. Well, that's tough right there, right? Now, Jesus kind of shifts gears here, and he says, Look, if you do this thing that's going to lead you in the sin, here's what you need to do about it. Now, this is a tough passage, and sadly, there are people throughout the history of the world who have, who have taken this passage quite literally and done exactly what Jesus has said. Now, I will let you decide for yourself based on your own conviction if you believe that Jesus is speaking literally here, but I do not believe that Jesus is speaking literally. If Jesus was speaking literally, then every one of us would have both eyes, both hands, and both feet cut off. Even if we were to gouge out our eyes, cut off our hands, and cut off our feet, that is still not going to keep us from sinning. Because as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, uh, sin begins in the heart. You can have no eyes, no hands, no feet. You can still be full of lust and full of, full of pride, full of hate, and full of anger. All of those things are sinful things. So you could, you could do everything that Jesus said here and still not be freed from sin. Now, Jesus uses a lot of examples, a lot of illustrations. He speaks in hyperbole a lot. He's trying to get people's attention, and I don't believe that we are to take Jesus literally here in that he wants us to gouge out our eyes or to harm ourselves in some way. Now, there are many people in the world that say, I take the Bible literally. Many Christians say that. But I have yet in my own experience to meet a single Christian who has cut off their own hand or gouged out their eyes or cut off their feet. And so people who say, I take the Bible literally and you're not going to change my mind, it's clear that they don't, that they recognize that Jesus speaks in this illustrative language, that he uses these hyperbole. Now, that's just part of the problem that we see here. Jesus wants us, I think, to take a radical position against sin, not necessarily uh, by physically doing these things, but recognizing that, that things that cause us to sin, we need to separate ourselves from. That is, if our eyes look upon things that cause us to sin, then we need to flee from that thing that we're looking upon. If our feet carry us to places that are going to lead us to sin, then we need to turn and go another direction and not be led into those sinful things. If our hands are doing something sinful, then we need to stop uh, giving in to whatever that sinful thing that, that our hands are doing. I, I think that Jesus is using these physical body parts to tell us, look, uh, your feet carry you to places you don't need to go. Your hands do things they don't need to do, and your eyes see things they don't need to see. And if you're guilty of any of those areas and your body's leading you into those things, then flee from those things. Turn from the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, I believe that's the point that Jesus is trying to make there. Now, that's just my interpretation. I could be wrong, but I would encourage you to be prayerful if you uh, begin to take these literal, and please uh, seek me or someone else out to talk to uh, before you cut your own hands off uh, for sure because I don't believe that that's what Jesus is saying but I do believe that Jesus is saying we are to treat our sin seriously this is serious strong language it gets our attention right even when I was reading it some of you were probably saying if not all of you whoa what does that mean wait a minute am I supposed to cut my hand off you know it, it gets our attention it draws us in and that's what Jesus wants to do. He wanted to get his disciples' attention. He wants to get your and I, uh, attention and say, look, sin is a serious thing, and you need to take sin seriously. Now, uh, he goes on to say, you need to take it seriously because it would be better to enter life uh, not having an eye or not having a hand 
then to be, uh, uh, as it says, uh, have two hands and go to hell, the unquenchable fire. Now, let's talk about hell here for a second because the word hell there, if we interpret it with what our mind thinks of as hell, we may miss what Jesus was saying there. Now, it's unfortunate, and I say it's unfortunate, that too many times in our translations, there are several words that are translated as hell. Now, when we, when we think of hell, we think of a place maybe of eternal punishment. We think of a horrible place of suffering for those who reject Jesus Christ. And, and, and when we think of hell, we think about that place. And I think that that place does exist. I think that's pretty clear throughout the Bible. But really, when we, when, what we're thinking about in, in strictly uh, literal biblical terms is the lake of fire. That's what we see in, in Revelation. That's where those are going to suffer in the lake of fire. Uh, and we can call it hell. That's fine. That's okay. But the problem is that all the words that we see uh, translated as hell in our translations uh, m actually have different meanings. Not that Jesus may not be using the, the literal meaning that the word means uh, to try to make that connection between a spiritual hell. He very well may be. But it's important for us when we see the word hell in our translations to realize what is really there. Now, some translations uh, will not translate and put the word hell. They will put the original word there. And I think that that's a little more helpful to us. Now, if you have a good study Bible, it's probably going to have a note to tell you what these original words are. Now, I'll tell you the four words that are used in our translations that are uh, translated as hell, or, or maybe it's better to say interpreted as hell, uh, that, that, that whoever translated this translation and many others may interpret what Jesus is saying as the spiritual hell that we think of, but, but Jesus may have been speaking, again, as we talked about with the children, in a physical sense of a place that was there at their time. Now, the four words that we see in Scripture that are translated as hell are sheol, that's a word we see a lot in the Old Testament, and the, the Greek version of the Hebrew word sheol that we see in the New Testament is Hades. Now, two separate words, one's Hebrew and one's Greek, but they're both the same place. They're both the exactly, uh, exactly the same place that's being talked about. Hades is simply the Greek, Greek form of the word sheol. Now, sheol and Hades is simply the abode of the dead, where dead people go. We even see righteous people of God speaking about going to Sheol in the Old Testament. And so when we see Sheol and we see Hades, uh, we should not instantly think of that as being in our mind what we think of as a spiritual hell, a place of torment. Because many times, most times, I would say that that's not at all uh, what's being spoken of by those in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Now, uh, maybe one day we'll go through that in more detail. I know we have in the past, but uh, we'll save all that Sheol and Hades for another day. Uh, Sheol is the only word in the Old Testament, I believe, that is translated as hell. I may be mistaken. Uh, but in the New Testament, we have three words, uh, one of which I just mentioned is Hades. Uh, another uh, is Tartarus. Uh, and the third is uh, Gehenna, which is what we see in our passage today. Now, if we were to read this maybe in a, in a, in a more literal sense without an interpretation of what it meant, uh, it would say something like this. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to Gehenna. Now, it's important that we recognize the word Gehenna there because Gehenna was an actual real physical place that we see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we also see it referred to as Topheth in the Old Testament. And it's also referred to as the Valley of Hinnom. And that's where we get the word Gehenna from. Gehenna comes from the Hebrew word uh, Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna, which means Valley of. Now, we see Topheth, also known as the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, in the Old Testament. It's a real place that was outside of Jerusalem. And if we were to take this verse as to what it literally says, it would say uh, it's better to lose your eye, your hand, your foot, than to go into Gehenna. Now, we see a few references in the Old Testament about Gehenna. Let's look at them to maybe better understand uh, just how bad Gehenna, the physical place, was. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10, we see this passage about King Josiah. 
who, who was a good king of, of Israel and who did away with all the evil that were there. Now, there weren't many good kings in Israel and Judah's past. Most, well, all of Israel's kings were bad. Uh, jo, Josiah was a king of Judah. They had a few good kings. Uh, but, but Josiah was a good king in doing away with all this idol worship and things that were going on. And in first king, uh, excuse me, second Kings chapter 23, verse 10, it says, He defiled Topheth, which is the valley of Hinnom so that no one could make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Molech. Now, Molech was a false god. And what Israel did oftentimes was they sacrificed their children through the fire to a false god. Now, that's a pretty horrible thing. Uh, that tells you just how bad things were back then. We look at our world today and say, boy, things are bad now. They've never been this bad. Well, people in Israel's day were burning their children in fires to false gods. Now, hopefully, none of us knows anybody that's sacrificed their child. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen today in our world. I'm, I know it does. Uh, but it happened back then. The people of Israel were evil, and Josiah was dealing with this evil. But the place where the evil was taking place, this Topheth, or the Valley of Hinnom, was where these people were sacrificing their children to a false god. So it was already a bad place. We see that in uh, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 31 through 33, it says, They have built the high places of Topheth in the valley of Hinnom in order to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, a thing I did not command. I never entertained the thought. Therefore, take note, days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when this place will no longer be called Topheth, or the valley of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. Topheth will become a cemetery, where there will be no other burial place. The corpses of these people will become food for the birds of the sky and for the wild animals of the land, with no one to scare them away. Now here we see what Gehenna was, the Valley of Hinnom. It was such an evil place that God said, look, this place is not going to be known as the Valley of Hinnom. It's going to be known as the Valley of Slaughter because the dead will be buried there. The birds and the animals will eat the carcasses, the corpses of the dead that were there. So when we see the Valley of Gehenna mentioned, or, or the Valley of Hinnom, or Gehenna mentioned here, what Jesus ta is talking about, literally, was a literal place outside of Jerusalem where dead bodies were buried, where corpses were. Now, many scholars and theologians say that this was a place where uh, that was always on fire, where they would throw their garbage there, where they would throw the dead bodies there of the evil people who were criminals. And there would be fires burning there all the time. Uh, if you've ever been by a garbage dump, you may have been by a garbage dump at a time when fire was burning. That's what you do. You burn the trash off. Now, I don't know of any scriptural reference to, to, uh, to affirm that. Uh, there must be some good source for that to come from because many scholars or theologians believe it. I don't know if that's true or not, that it was always burning, but if it is true, then that would fit even more so with what Jesus said when he speaks of Gehenna. Now, we cannot deny that it was a place where corpses were for people who were put, people who did evil, because God tells us that in Jeremiah. And that was probably the case of Jesus' day. And so he uses this place, Gehenna, and he says, look, it would be better for you to lose your eye, your hand, your foot, to enter into life with, with only one eye, hand, or foot, than to go to Gehenna. Now, that would fit in a strictly literal sense, too. Don't live in an evil way, because if you're evil and do horrible things, this is where your body's going to be thrown. It's literally going to be thrown outside of Jerusalem. It's going to be thrown in a place with all the other corpses, and it's going to be a horrible place of punishment. Jesus could have very well meant that in a very physical sense. Now, he does say there, it is better for you to enter life. Now, that may be a clue that Jesus is also speaking in a spiritual sense here because the people he's speaking to have already entered life. They're already alive. What life may he be speaking of that they are going to enter? Well, he may be speaking of eternal life that comes only through him. So uh, it's very likely, I believe, that Jesus is using this physical example to speak in spiritual terms. Now, some would say that he's not. He's just speaking literally, and that may be so. Or he may be speaking in both, as we talked about with the reference of the little child. Jesus is saying here, look, there's punishment for evil. 
even if he's speaking in a literal sense, well, we should not desire to seek punishment for the evil we do in this world. Nobody should seek any kind of punishment. And if punishment is bad in this world for the evil we do, then how much more so will it be in hell or the lake of fire that we see mentioned in Scripture? It's going to be much worse there. And so it's possible, maybe even likely, that Jesus is making a reference here to hell. But we can't be sure. I don't know that we can be completely sure. That's why I say it's better for us to, if we see it literally where it says Gehenna, we can make an informed decision based on the place that was literally there or not. Now Jesus goes on to say in verse 41 and, and at the end of each of these sections here, uh, or excuse me, verse 44, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now it could be, uh, that when he's speaking of this worm that does not die here, uh, that he's speaking of their soul or their conscience in some way, this is a really difficult thing to understand and interpret. I have five uh, uh, commentaries in my office, and, and all five of them, three of them just don't even acknowledge the worm that never dies. They don't acknowledge it in one way or another. One only briefly mentions it, and the other gives the explanation that I just gave you, that perhaps it's representative of a consciousness or a soul. That's uh, the same thing you're going to find online, too. You can search, and you're not going to find any firm conclusions as to what this worm that does not die means. Uh, it could go along with the fact that there are corpses there, and Jesus is just saying, look, there's this horrible place. I think the literal word for worm there would be maggot, and that's what you would see where there were dead bodies. It could just be that Jesus is adding to the illustrative language that he's using here to say, look, here's what it's like in the actual valley of Gehenna, and this is a bad place, so live your life so that you don't suffer in that way, either physically or in a spiritual sense. It's possible that the worm there could be the consciousness of the person who rejects Jesus and is suffering for all of eternity, uh, knowing the guilt of their sin. But it's hard really to make that connection because we don't see that language that our soul or our conscience uh, is referred to as a worm anywhere in Scripture. So I don't know really what Jesus meant here. I'll just tell you, I'm not really sure exactly what he meant, and you may not be either, and you are not alone. There are many scholars and theologians that are still not quite sure. What we can know about what Jesus said about the worm and the fire is that he is quoting from Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. The very last verse of Isaiah is, is what Jesus is quoting there, and it says, As they leave, they will see the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. Now, a little context there. He's speaking of judgment that's coming upon the people of Israel because, as we see all throughout Scripture, they are disobedient, and there are going to be some that leave Jerusalem, and as they are leaving, they are going to see those who suffered the consequences of their punishment. Now, this is a literal thing that actually happened, as we've talked about uh, already. So when Jesus says, talking about going by Gehenna, he could be referring, referring to the literal place and not hell, or could be alluding to hell in what he says. But after that, it says in Isaiah 66, 24, For their worm will never die. Their fire will never go out, and they will be a horror to all mankind. Now, he used this the same language there, but again, it's hard for us to know exactly what this worm is that's being talked about. Uh, if we look at the fire in a spiritual sense, we could say the fires of hell or the lake of fire never burn out, or we could say that, look, it's a garbage dump in Gehenna outside of Jerusalem that's always kept burning. Uh, it fits in both ways, and it's really hard maybe to know for sure exactly what Jesus meant in those verses. But uh, we see Jesus repeat that, that line here in all three of these occasions. So I told you all it was going to be a doozy today. It's a tough one. So I would encourage you to uh, study this and pray about it some more too because uh, it's, it's really maybe a hard one for us to wrap our head around. Uh, but... We need to take Jesus at his word, maybe not in a literal sense, but in that what he said is true. We should flee from sin. We should not give in to sin. We should not let sin rule over us, and we should flee from it in every which way we can so we don't have to suffer the consequences, both worldly consequences are eternal consequences. That is definitely true for us, and we see that spelled out, through, uh, spelled out to us throughout all of the rest of Scripture. Now, the last couple of verses really don't get any easier. It shifts gears to a different topic, 
but it is still just as difficult to know exactly what they mean. In the same way that the worm in the fire is talked about, and, and, and it's unknown or, or unclear, uh, you will find the same problem if you research this passage among scholars and theologians and commentaries on these next two verses. It's not really clear what exactly Jesus was meaning and why he inserted this at this time, if indeed Mark's account of what is being said, if Jesus said this following the comments that he just said. In Mark chapter 9, verse 49, it says, For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, some of your translations may stop right there, uh, and some of them may say something further, and, and, and some would add, And every sacrifice will be salted with salt. Now, even if your translation doesn't have that, and every sacrifice will be salted with salt, uh, you probably have that referenced in your footnotes. Now, the reason why it's not in every translation is because the, the manuscripts that we translate from, they don't all have that in there. Some have it, some do not. And so figuring out which one is right is difficult. Uh, as, as always, I always prefer that it be in there with a footnote that says, hey, this may not supposed to be in there. Uh, but whether uh, Jesus actually said this or not, it is true. Uh, that, that idea that in every sacrifice is to be salted with salt is something that was part of the Old Testament law and the law of Moses. Now, we know that Jesus talks about salt in the Sermon of the Mount and that Christians are to be the salt of the world. But he says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, we see this, this, this reference of salted by fire, and then we see also salted by salt. Well, let's look at the Old Testament references to salting uh, the sacrifice. And one of them we'll look at is in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Leviticus 2, 13 says, You are to season each of your grain offerings with salt. You must not omit from your grain offering the salt of the covenant with your God. You are to present salt with each of your offerings. Now, that's pretty clear there. We can't really deny that, that the offerings that the people of Israel were to offer were to be salted with actual, literal, physical salt. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 23 through 24, When you have finished the purification, you are to present a young unblemished bull and an unblemished ram from the flock. You must present them before the Lord. The priest will throw salt on them and sacrifice them as a burnt offering to the Lord. So that's the language that we see in the Old Testament law about sacrifices being salted with salt. But what does Jesus mean when he says, for everyone will be salted with fire? Well, I'm not really sure exactly what Jesus meant there. I'll give you some scriptures to, that, that, that may be what Jesus meant. One of them is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 13. We see references uh, of Christians being baptized by fire or going through the fire. We see those type of references in the New Testament on a few occasions, and maybe that's what Jesus is referring to here. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, Each one's works will become obvious, for the day will disclose it because... It will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's works. Uh, maybe that's what Jesus means here when he says we will all be salted by fire. That is, every person will go through fire, but only those who trust in him, only their works, only their trust in him, those will come through the fire. The rest will suffer the fire for all of eternity. They will be cast into the lake of fire. Maybe that's what Jesus means when he said all will be salted by fire, but not everyone or everyone's works, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, will come out of the fire. Some will be burned up, but not those that are built on Jesus Christ. Those that are built on Jesus Christ, even though some of our works may be burned up, our souls will still be saved because we are on Jesus Christ. The fire will not consume us. Maybe that's what Jesus uh, was referring to here. Luke chapter 3, verse 16 says, John answered them all. That's John the Baptist. He said, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, again, we have some figurative language there. When we are baptized in Jesus, we're not dunked into a blazing fire, but he's using language here, a representative language, and he says that we will be 
baptized with fire when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we see a similar thing referenced in Acts when the Holy Spirit did come upon the people. So here's another reference of believers going through fire in some sense. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, it says, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now here, Peter uses the illustration of gold being refined by fire uh, to, to, to make an illustration for the Christian who's going through various struggles, that we are going through the fire. Sometimes we even say that. You know, I'm going through the fire. But even though we go through the fires of this world, we know the fires will never consume us, so to speak, in a spiritual sense. Anything the world throws at us, we are greater than the one who is in the world, and we can overcome whatever uh, comes upon us through Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Now, perhaps that's what Jesus means here when he says salted by fire. That's my best attempt. That's the best, best I can do when I look at that and try to figure it out. Perhaps that's what Jesus is meaning when he says that everyone will be salted with fire. He goes on to say in verse 50, closing here, Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you make it salty? Now, that's the same thing Jesus has said in other parts of Scripture, that salt is a good thing. He uses salt because we recognize that salt is good. We probably have all ate something before and reached for that salt shaker. There ain't enough salt on there. I ate a lot of Cheez-Its. I've been eating a lot of Cheez-Its the last few months. And not every box of Cheez-Its is created equally. Some are, are burnt and stale, but others are cooked to perfection, and they are full of salt. Others don't have any salt. I eat them, it's like, man, I got a box that ain't got much salt. But the ones that have a lot of salt, like, oh, man, I got the good box. And boy, I eat those things up because we crave that salt. It's not good for us, but, but, but we crave it because it tastes good to us. And Jesus uses the illustration of salt because his people can understand it. Not only is it good for, for eating and, and tasting things, but it's also a great preservative. Uh, that's how you can preserve meats and things. You can cover it up with salt. And so uh, Jesus says here, look, salt is good, but if the salt should lose its, salt in it, uh, lose its flavor, how can you make it salty? Now, as Christians, Jesus wants us to be salty for the world. That is that we are something pleasing and desirable to the world, that when the world sees us, we are a refreshing seasoning. That when people see us, they see Jesus, and they want more of Jesus. And in the same way that I want more of the Cheez-Its, uh, our Christian walk should lead people to want more of Jesus because it is something that is, that is spiritually tasty and something that people can see that there is good in Jesus Christ through his followers. He says at the end of the verse, "...have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another." Now, again, that's kind of a, a strange thing. I don't know exactly what Jesus meant when he said have salt among yourselves apart from what I just said, and that is that as Christians, it's clear that we are to be the salt of the world because Jesus tells us to do that. So maybe we need to check our life and see uh, if, we are, if we are salty, if we are uh, someone who is being a good representative for the Lord, a good ambassador for the Lord. There's a lot for us to consider in this passage today, and I, I wanted to kind of read this whole section together because each of these little, little parts that we read all have their own difficulties in understanding exactly what Jesus was talking about. But at the very least, at the very core, if we could maybe look at these verses kind of, kind of in an overview of all of what Scripture says, we who put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ are children of God. And we only become children of God by following Him. If we are a child of God, we need to live our life like we are. We need to humble ourselves. We need to be a servant of all. We need to not be a stumbling block for others. And we need to watch our own life to make sure that there is not sin in our life that is causing us to stumble in some way. And if there is, we need to avoid that sin. We need to not let our feet be ready to run to sinfulness, but to be ready to run to Jesus. That we don't let our hands be ready to commit acts of sins, but we allow our hands to do the works of God. That we don't allow our eyes to look on the evil things of the world, but we are, allow our eyes to look to Jesus and to look to the Word of God and to look to Him for guidance. 
and that we are to allow God to transform our life in a way that we know that whatever fires we go through, that God will be with us. That we live our life in a way that we are salt. That we live our life in a way that people can see the love of God through us, through our actions, how we live, what we do. And that the world says, look, I want to be a Christian. That they don't see the church and things that churches do and preachers do and all the evil stuff that sometimes goes on. But that we look at ourselves and say, okay, I don't want people to look at me. I don't want people to look at this church and say, boy, I don't want anything to do with them. We should say, God, I want people to look at me and I want people to look at Enterprise Baptist Church and say, you are doing the work of God. You are being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And if we don't understand all the things that we saw today, I think that those things I just mentioned we can understand because we see those truths all throughout Scripture. If you're not a child of God today, then I want you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. If you you feel the Holy Spirit convicting you, maybe you look back at some of the things in your life and you say, boy, I haven't taken my sin seriously, but I see that Jesus wants me to. Well, good news, He wants you to take it serious and to repent of it and to come to Him so that you can be forgiven. And if you've not followed Him today, all you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, I trust you. I repent. I put my faith in you. I'm not going to live for me, but I'm going to live for you. It's just that simple. There's no fancy words we have to say or nothing else. We follow Jesus with our heart and we follow through with baptism because that's what God's word calls us to do. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning and I thank you for these good words and I pray that you would help us to understand them as best we can and God, even what we can't understand will help us not to worry about it too much, but to just, just to stand on the truth of what we know, the truth of Jesus Christ, that He is your Son. And I pray, God, that if there's one that's never put their faith in Him today, that they would be convicted, that they would do so in this moment, God, that they would open their heart, that they would repent. And after these services today, God, that they would just come let me know that they made that decision to follow you, and that we can follow through with baptism, dear Lord, just as your Word commands us to. God, I pray that you help us not to fret too much over hard passages like this, but just to to understand them as best we can, to take them serious as as best we can, to live by them as best we can, dear Lord, and to live our life in a way that's going to be a good representation of you and who you are and your love and your forgiveness through Jesus. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's service. To learn more about Jesus, call or text Pastor Shan at 601-657-0180 or email him at shanvn at me.com. You can also visit us at www.enterprisebaptist.church or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ebcliberty. We hope that you have been blessed by today's service.